2 Corinthians chapter 11. You should have been there already. <clears throat> Waiting. Should have been there already. Uh, we're going to look at contract law. Who's, who's in our legal department? Anybody here? A lawyer? Had to do, who in here has ever signed a contract? Rental contract? An auto loan? An auto lease? Um, a mortgage is a contract. Um, sometimes you uh, union workers will sign a contract. They'll approve a contract. Um, we had a guy that um, would call our ministry every now and then from Texas. And he worked as for years in the oil business. They call it oil business down there. But he worked in the oil business as and he was a mediator between union laborers and corporations. And when it came time for contract negotiations, they would bring him in to be a, a binding arbiter, meaning that he would look at, contra he would settle contract disputes. And his job was to look at the contract that was agreed to by both parties. And when there was a dispute, it was his job to determine whether or not either party had a legitimate dispute or not. That was his job. And he used to call me all the time and, <clears throat> and kind of give me ideas and things about how contracts work. And, and when he first heard me talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament as, as a contract, I mean, that just, that got him. I mean, he, and he called me and said, you're dead on with this. He said that if you look at your Bible, you're, you're looking at a legally binding document. Okay? It is. It's a, it is. And if you read the King James, you'll see that there's language in here that, I mean, you, if you've ever seen a contract before, you recognize it. There is an offer made by God and an agreement by man, if you go to Mount Sinai, God made an offer to Israel that if they would live according to his guidelines, then he would give them the land. And that was his, that was his agreement with them. And they, accept, they accepted it. They said, all that thou hast said, we will do. They accepted the agreement. And then God stipulated in the agreement that it was not only just between God and that generation, but it was binding to all generations. That it would be for the people who would, who would be born after that contract. So it was a, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the legal terminology is, but it was an inherited contract that anybody born after the date of Mount Sinai, that they also were, were bound under the terms of that contract. And the idea was if they were, if they were living in that land, God had the legal right to um, put them out of the land. In other words, throw them out of their own house. God had the right to throw them out for violating the terms of the contract. Did God do that? Yes. And if you even look at it in terms of a marital contract, God had a marital agreement with Israel. He said, I have espoused you as my bride. And at some point, God had to write a bill of divorce to Israel and said, you're not my wife anymore. I'm putting you out because you keep going, whoring around to everybody else and you will not stay true to me, so therefore I'm going to throw you out. And that's what God did. And so if you look at it along those terms, and here's where we get into um, this, me and uh, this gentleman here, his name is Jeff. We were talking about this in my office about the language of the King James. This is the Bible that I was saved under. Nine years old. I agreed to the terms of God's offer of a promise of giving me eternal life. He made that offer to me, and I accepted the terms of that offer. And the terms of that offer is, I believe what God said. Okay, I believe and trust God and only God. And so we're, that's kind of how we're going to look at it. So if somebody comes along then and wants to rewrite the contract, I'm not for that. I am not 
I am not for that at all. And that's, that's where we are right now. So 2 Corinthians 11, when we, um, w- w- with this in mind, when we get to the part, <clears throat> especially where Paul said, I espouse you to one husband, you're looking at the terms of a contract. An espousal, uh, well, let's read it, and I'll explain something. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul here is acting as a mediator um, between Christ and the church, and Paul is saying to us as the church, there is a, there is a marital agreement in place, an espousal a legal espousal in place right now. Verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, and I want you to think of in terms of a contract, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received another spirit, which he have not received, or another gospel. Think in terms of a contract. If you have accepted a different contract, with a different gospel and a different spirit and a different agreement. Even contracts have spirits, do they not? When they say, well, that the spirit of the agreement was, we use that terminology to, to say, well, you know, the idea behind this agreement or the spirit behind this agreement is, is that they're going to do this and we're going to do this. And, that, and when judges on a, on a Supreme Court deal with issues of, American law, constitutional law, they deal with what they would refer to as the spirit of the Constitution. When, if, you were to, if, if I were to ask you, do you believe in separation of church and state according to the Constitution? The, what would be the spirit behind the idea of, what amendment is it? The First Amendment that separates Congress shall make no law establishing a religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The spirit of that amendment, of that part of the Constitution, is not a total separation of anything related to religion out of government. It's just that government, Congress, will not establish a state religion, nor will Congress ever prohibit the free exercise of our religion. And the free exercise of our religion includes the ability to go outside of the walls of this church and evangelize people and talk to people about our religion. That's, our, that's the exercise of our religion. So the spirit of, of that constitutional amendment is that America would remain, it was recognized that America was a Christian people a christian based nation not that everybody in america was saved but our founding fathers recognized that you could not separate bible christianity from where our laws come from you cannot separate those two so anyway that would be the spirit of that and when you're talking about another spirit then you must be talking about another contract another agreement which you have not accepted, or, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. See the word accepted there? In verse 4, the word accepted is your signature on God's contract. You signed it. You remember the day when you signed the contract? Do you remember the day when you bow in reverence to Christ and you accepted His offer of forgiveness and his offer of eternal life. Do you remember that day when you accepted that? I'll wake you up here in a little bit. Okay? I'm going to get a crank. Remember the old motors you crank up? I'm, I'm cranking. Okay? Do you remember the day you accepted the contract? You signed it. That's what that word means. Which ye, or another gospel which you have not accepted. If someone comes and says... Well, the real gospel is you believe, but you must keep the law. That's a different contract. I am not, I was not in, I did not accept that agreement. You did not accept that agreement. And so anybody who tries to 
slip in different clauses, different additions to the, to the New Testament, to the New Covenant. See, even the Hebrew roots people refuse the language of the King James. They don't call the New Testament the New Testament. Does anybody know what they call it? The renewed covenant. Not the new covenant. The renewed covenant. What does that mean? You're still under Mount Sinai. If, if your job offers you a, a new contract and you read it and you go, this is the exact same contract I was under for the last five years. It's not a new contract. It's just renewing the same contract. Does that make sense? So the terminology of the renewed covenant mean, doesn't mean that we have a brand new covenant with God. It means that we are going back voluntarily under the terms of Mount Sinai and renewing that covenant. And what that means is you're now under and obligated to do everything that God said. And if you don't do everything God said, you're going to hell. Period. You violate the contract. How, how many times? When you have a rental agreement, how many times do you get away with not paying the rent? If the contract says pay the rent first of the month, and we're going to give you five days, and after five days, you don't pay the, you don't pay the rent, then I'm going to start procedures to get you out of there. That's, you signed it. You agreed to it. All you have to do is not pay the rent one stinking time. Now, the landlord can say, I'll give, well, I know you're having hard times. If you get it to me by the first of next month with next month's rent, then I'll accept that. He can do that. How many times did God give grace to Israel in the Old Testament? How many times did God not kick them out? Hundreds, numerous times. God had grace on them. He gave them the land. He gave them everything. He kept them in there. But finally, there was a point to where God said, I'm done. And God put the Israelites, first of all, the ten tribes out of the north, the Assyrians came and put God, and God allowed them to pull them right out of their own houses. And, and they lost their farms, they lost their vineyards, they lost their cattle, and they lost their own homes. And God allowed it because they violated the terms. And then Judah, the same thing. Nebuchadnezzar comes in 70 years. Because, and they lost their homes. They lost their cattle. They lost their farms. They lost their city. They lost their temple. They lost everything for 70 years because they violated God's covenant. So if you want to say that we're under the renewed covenant, you can be if you want to. Don't you dare ever have a dirty thought from here on out. Because that's covetousness. That's breaking the law. You're done. That's all, it, that's all it is. So if you accept this gospel, don't let anybody con you into accepting a different one. Because it's contract law. So let's look at the first contract. Galatians 3. Turn there. Galatians 3. Boy, you get if you start thinking about this this deal, the whole and the language of the Bible as contract law. Well, let me let me. I was going to go back and turn to Galatians three nineteen. Here's what Judge Judy says. She will have people that come in and be a man and a woman, and uh, he bought her a ring, an engagement ring. $10,000 engagement ring. She's wearing this $10,000 ring or $5,000 ring or whatever. And Judge Judy always says, she says, in my courtroom, I see it different. Other judges don't do this, but I do. She says, if it's an engagement ring, it is given in the hopes that there will be a future wedding. If... The wedding then is called off. The engagement ring ceases to belong to the woman and she has to give it back. She will rule that every single time. Because the contract, the espousal 
is a contract. The ring is given in anticipation along with the question, will you marry me? And the answer, when she accepted the ring, she said, yes, I will marry you. And that ring is given in anticipation of marriage. If the woman then decides that he's a whoremonger, he's been caught with all of us, he's not, he's not uh, letting go of his other girlfriend, she's caught him, she got his cell phone text messages, she, I mean, she's got everything in the world against him. I can prove it, Your Honor, I can prove that he's going out. The judge did say, fine, fine, don't marry him. But you've got to give the ring back. And she will make, and there have been women said, I ain't giving it back. And she said, you are too. You are too. I'm sending a marshal to your house within five days of, of the taping of this program, and you're going to produce that ring. Or I'm going to rule against you, and in the, in the, I can only give out $5,000. I'm going to rule against you to the term of $5,000. You're either going to give the ring back, or you're going to pay this guy that money. And she, doesn't, she does not flinch on this thing. Because an espousal is the idea that there is an anticipation of a marriage, and anything given in that anticipation is then, uh, what's the word? Forfeited. Forfeited. You forfeit the right to wear his ring. You have to give it back. And God, when he wrote Israel a bill of divorce, Israel forfeited her rights because she went whoring against her espoused husband. Okay? So Galatians 3.19, Wherefore then serveth the law was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand <coughs> of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now, what is he saying here? A mediator always mediates, be not, not just dealing with one person, but it deals with two parties. In legal term, the party, this is the party of the first part and the party of the second part, and everybody's having a party in a contract, okay? But a mediator then deals and negotiates the terms between the two parties. In the Old Testament, turn to, um, turn to Exodus 20. Moses was asked by Israel to be the mediator. Uh, Exodus 20, let's see here. There we go. Verse 18, this is after God gives his Ten Commandments. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us. And we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. At this point, the people of Israel have now elected Moses to be the spokesman. They said to Moses, if, if we want something, Moses, you go to God with it. But God had revealed himself in a limited fashion to Israel in Exodus 19. And then when he spoke Exodus 20, when he spoke those words, it scared Israel so bad, the thunderings, the lightnings, the, the noise, and the trumpets, the fire. They said, Moses, tell God, don't say any more to us. It'll kill us. Okay? So they established a mediator between them and God. Moses was, and this was a job Moses had already done. When God was going to speak to Pharaoh, who did he send? Moses. Moses became the mediator between, and, and I want you to think about this. I, I teach and preach against rebellion. There are always areas of authority that you're going to be under. Always. No man is separate from that. And even Israel, under the bondage of Pharaoh, God is the one who put them under Pharaoh. In the days of Joseph, when, they, when Joseph called for his father and his brethren to come down, they came and they lived in Goshen, which belonged to Pharaoh, and they were under the rule of Pharaoh. So now a new Pharaoh's there, and he doesn't like the Jews. He's afraid of them. I'm working on a message for this week for our conference about that. Something came to me this last week about the devil fears an army. And if you go back and look at why Pharaoh 
turn the Jews into slaves was he was because they were <laughs> they were very fruitful and they were multiplying and Pharaoh was afraid that they'll turn into an army against him and so he put them in this bondage but even at that Israel is under Pharaoh's authority and now God sends his mediator Moses to speak on behalf of God and Moses does not say we're leaving he says let my people go this is a negotiation. When you negotiate with God, you're best instructed to let God have his way. Amen? Because if God has to give ten plagues, he's going to give all ten of them, and he's going to prove that he's got the power and the authority, and Pharaoh finally said, get these people out of here. I don't want anything to do with them. And Pharaoh released them. What happened when Pharaoh tried to, um, he went against his own agreement with God. What happened? He lost his life. He had an agreement with God, I'll let the people go, but then he hardened his heart and he said, well, I'm going to go get them back. Uh-uh. That's not, that's disallowed. You're not going to do that. Okay? So Moses, uh, and, uh, well, I'm here, I'm talking about all this stuff, but the idea was Moses became the mediator between God and the people of Israel. So God gives his, his commandments and he sends them at the hand of a mediator. The mediator comes down from heaven and he offers the, and Israel's breaking the laws. So Moses goes back up and comes back down again. The second time he comes, Israel says, all that thou hast said we will do. They agreed to those 10 commandments. They agreed to do them. So the old covenant is do and live in the land of Canaan, the physical land on earth. You're going to be hard-pressed to find where God offered them eternal life under the terms of the old Mount Sinai covenant. I don't see it. I may be wrong. But I don't see God offering them eternal life under the terms of Mount Sinai. I see him offering the physical land of Israel. Okay, and from that point forward, then God is having to have a lot of mercy. And a lot of, they call it a grace period. And God has unlimited grace for Israel, but finally God has to cut it off. Uh, Galatians 3.10. Here's the contract. For as many, in fact, I'm going to read that whole deal of Galatians 3. Uh, Galatians 3, 1 through 10. I want to read that whole thing so we get the, the gist, the context of it. You understand everything. Uh, I'm, I'm lost here. Where's Galatians? There we go. Galatians 3. Let me get that back up on the screen here. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only what I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. And what is this, when they received the Spirit, does anybody know what that was? They received the Spirit. Turn to, hold your place there in Galatians 3, and turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Once you, ex you receive God's Spirit, he is, the Spirit is God's token to you that He's going to keep His promise. I'm not saying it the way the Bible says it. I'm going to have to read the scripture here. Um, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, which is the Bible. The Bible is part of this contract. When you hear the word of truth and you decide you believe it, that's, that's your acceptance of God's offer. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It's the Holy Spirit in you is God's signature. Okay? Look at verse 14. 
which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. The earnest in a contract. What is an earnest? Huh? It's like a down payment. You, you, you give what's called earnest money. Okay? And you go to the car dealership. You see that you want the showroom model that you work out a deal with them. And when they sign the contract and give you your copy, that is their signifying unto you their earnest to give you what you agreed to. Because usually when you buy a new car, it's very rare that you drive off with it that second. Okay? They usually say, give us time to get it ready for you. We got to clean it up and we got to do this. We got to get inspected. We got to do this. got to do that. Now you've already given them money. A down payment. You, you've given them your earnest. Now their earnest is the signed contract. They give you the signed contract. That sign, the signature is their seal. That's how we seal things nowadays. We seal them with our sig. The word signature has the word sign in it. We put our sign upon that. Back, if people couldn't read, they would just say, Put your mark there, and whatever mark that person would put on there, that was their signature. It was like them signing their name. You sign your name, they sign the contract. They're giving you the earnest and telling you, when this car is ready, we're going to give it to you. It then belongs to you. It's your car. So you walk out of the showroom with it in mind that that car now belongs to you, and they've given you the signed contract, and they're not going to sell it out from underneath you for somebody that comes running in and says, that showroom model, whatever, whatever that guy paid, I'll double it. Can't do it. Can't do it. You have a signed contract. You have it sealed from the company that that car, even though it's not physically in your custody, it is now your possession. Are you catching this? You now, with the sealing of the Holy Spirit, you now know that heaven, the inheritance, is yours. You know it's yours. You haven't been there yet. You haven't seen it yet. But you agreed that the description of it, you like, it's better than the alternative, and you've agreed to it, and God has given you His Spirit and sealed, he has signed in your heart the contract saying, I promise you I'm going to deliver heaven to you. Whew. What's good, isn't it? Amen. So, that's uh, in chapter 3, back, back at chapter 3, Galatians 3, verse 1. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Paul said that it's after you believe. When you believe then God puts his spirit in you, and his spirit is his word. His spirit is, is, is this Bible. Thy word have I hid in my heart. All right? So, back in, uh, so how did you receive the, the Holy Spirit? By the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. That was done by the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, see that ministration, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's Jesus being the uh, mediator, the negotiator, the minister. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Again, it is a contract based upon you believing what God said. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. See that word accounted? That's an accounting term. Abraham had an, made an agreement, God made an agreement with Abraham. Abraham, if you believe me, I'll give you my righteousness. I'll let you wear my robe. Amen. And it covers all your sins and transgressions. Amen. Counted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In these shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For Verse 10, here it is. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. 
for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in how many things? All things. Which are written in the book of the law to do them. And God was sure to include your thoughts by saying, Thou shalt not covet. Coveting is breaking the very law the same way adultery is breaking the law. So God made it airtight. And the Jews set about then to find loopholes in God's covenant. So the Jews then removed themselves from From the spirit of the agreement, the spirit of the agreement, they removed themselves from that by writing secondary books and other rabbinical teachings that place loopholes in, one of the loopholes was a Sabbath day journey. You could walk so many feet on the Sabbath day, but then you had to stop. So they put a loophole in where you could, if you walked the Sabbath day journey and stopped and rested, you could then go walk another one and stop and rest. And then walk another one and stop. And So does that violate the spirit of the agreement? Sure it does. It's just a way to get out of it. And this is what we do. We try to find ways out of our agreement with God. All right? It makes sense so far to everybody. I mean, just think in terms of a contract. And the old contract was do it all. And if you don't, you're cursed. If you don't continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, if you don't continue in those things, then you're, you're now back under the curse and there, there is no offer of salvation to you. Jeremiah 11 Verse 3, God said, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Deuteronomy 27, 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now that ought to make you think now, the next time you say amen. Because saying amen is an agreement of God's contract, God's word. It means that you accept it, you agree it, you agree to it, you signify by saying amen. The word amen simply means so be it. And it is the name, or it is a name, of Jesus. He is the amen. And I want you to think about that. If, if, if us saying amen signifies us being in agreement with God's contract, God also sends his amen to us, which is Jesus. God says, by the way, God says amen better than we do. Our amen is just a word. God's amen is his son, Jesus Christ, which is also the spirit of his son, signifying to us that God has sealed this agreement with us, and he means to keep it. So, I'm going to ask a big question here. Under the terms of the old covenant, how many sins did you have to do to violate the whole agreement? One. James said, if a man offend the law in one point, he is guilty of all. Under the new covenant, how many sins can you commit? Okay. The number of sins you can commit is equal to the amount of scourging that you can bear by your father. Amen? Because he said, like he said to David, Though he sin, I'll chastise him. But my mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. And if you look at Saul, Saul broke 
the agreement of faith. He despised and rejected the word. The contract was offered, and Saul rejected it. He rejected the word of the Lord, which is the contract, the offer, the word of life. He rejected it, and because God rejected it, he now has this evil spirit all over him. And he dies under the curse of witchcraft. Well, it's good stuff, isn't it? Okay, so this week, your homework assignment is to study, study the word covenant in your Bible. Study that word. There, there are some covenants that are unconditional. When God sent, when God put his sign of the bow in the cloud, that is an unconditional covenant that God made with the earth. I'm not going to destroy the earth, and here's, here's, the, here's the sign, this, here's my signature. Every time you see a rainbow, that's God, think of it as God's seal, God's signature, that he's going to keep his promise. And to this date, God has kept his promise. And every time you see the rainbow, you know that God is still keeping his promise. Okay? So there are unconditional covenants in the Bible. But there are also conditional covenants in the Bible. And the one that we are under for salvation is, and has been, and is a conditional covenant. If you accept the covenant, you, would, you accept that you're going to abide by the terms of the covenant. And that is, you continue in, we don't continue in the law, we continue in Faith. Faith. Okay? Heavenly Father, teach us your law. Teach us your agreement. Teach us, Lord, how to keep covenants, how to keep our word, how to keep our promise. Lord, you teach us in this book that you keep your promise. You've, Lord, you've given us the seal of the earnest of the Holy Spirit. You're, you, have, you have given us, Lord, the token that you are going to keep your promise to us. And Father, we thank you, God, for offering us sinners a way to have eternal life, a way to be sin-free. And that is to believe what you said, believe what you spoke. Father, teach us great things out of your law. Teach us, Lord, your covenant, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen.